Very well. Welcome back, everybody. Finally, we are here after a very long preparation to prove the fundamental theorem for dimensional regularization and dimensional renormalization, namely the convergence theorem for dimensional regularization, which is actually a theorem one in the famous paper by Brighton Lona Meison in Communications of Mathematical Physics. Here you can find the reference. So the statement of the theorem is uh, very basic and uh, covers essentially everything we want to know about renormalization. Namely, consider a Feynman graph with G, which might have subgraphs H. Then we define the structure of the R operation for renormalization as we did in our chapter 2.1 of the lecture, where we did this recursive uh, subtraction of divergences step by step uh, from smaller subdiagrams to bigger ones and finally to the full graph. In this context of the R operation, we defined R bar of uh, a graph, which subtracts all the subdivergencies, and then we defined um, an operation T, which extracts then the res remaining divergencies of R bar of such a graph. And uh, here, in the context of dimensional regularization, we define this always as the one over epsilon pole part of whatever is uh, this R bar of H. Now, the statement of the theorem is this. This singular part here, which can be defined as a singular part in a Laurent expansion in epsilon, and uh, yeah, uh, this singular part, T of R bar of H, consists of poles in epsilon, and uh, the degree of these poles is uh, bounded by the loop number of the subgraph H. So there are poles at most of the form 1 over epsilon up to 1 over epsilon to the power LH, where LH is the number of loops in H. Then the coefficients of these 1 over epsilon poles are polynomials of a certain degree, namely of the degree omega H, which is the power counting degree of the subgraph H in the external momenta and the masses of the graph H. And here is again a formula for the power counting degree of the graph H. It is given by the dimensionality D0 times the loop number from the loop integrations minus two times the number of internal lines in the graph and uh, now a new element plus RH where RH denotes the numerator degree. So if we have an arbitrary Feynman diagram with numerators, for instance, momenta in the numerator, then this uh, denotes the degree uh, uh, in particular of loop momenta uh, in the numerator of this Feynman graph. So this is the naive degree of divergence of the graph and uh, we get divergences which are polynomial in the relevant physics quantities uh, of this degree. This is the first part of the theorem and the second part is then if we complete the R operation, so we uh, extract all the divergences in this way for all the subgraphs and then complete the R operation, then we obtain a renormalized expression for our full graph G. And this is then uh, finite, of course, and it is a function of the following quantities. It is a function still of the dimensionality D d0 minus 2 epsilon, and it is analytic in epsilon, which in particular means that we can take the limit epsilon going to zero. And it is a function of, of course, all the external momenta and the masses of the graph. And uh, what kind of function is it? It is a C infinity function, so infinitely many times differentiable and continuous of all these arguments, as long as we keep this uh, curly epsilon in the propagators um, positive, so from this I epsilon prescription. And if we take the limit epsilon going to zero plus, then uh, it becomes a distribution um, in the mathematical sense of the external momenta and the masses in the graph. This is the fundamental theorem. Let me give some remarks on it. So the first remark is what is actually the non-trivial part of the theorem, which is uh, in particular interesting. 
The non-trivial part is, of course, uh, the structure of the poles, first of all. So the fact that the divergences in epsilon are of a particular kind, namely, um, let's say, um, simple or multiple poles in epsilon, no um, other structures um, can appear. And uh, the fact that as a function of the external momenta, it is a polynomial of a bounded degree. This is the first non-trivial part, so the structure of poles. And uh, the second non-trivial element is the behavior of the final result. Uh, what kind of analytic structure does it have? So it is analytic in epsilon and C infinity of all the other variables. So these are the particularly non-trivial aspects of the theorem. And uh, this is in particular what we need to prove. And of course, all of this is um, in evidence from our examples. In the examples, we had exactly this behavior. And uh, remember, we had in particular those two examples where we did explicit calculations. So for example, we uh, calculated explicitly that this particular sum where the counter term here is determined by the divergence of this subgraph gives a full result which has a local um, divergence. In other words, the divergence was a polynomial of a certain degree in the external momentum of this graph in line with this statement here. And we also showed the same uh, for such a two-loop graph with overlapping divergences where we needed to add two counterterm graphs, namely this one with a left counterterm insertion and that one with a right counterterm insertion. But also then, the final result of this combination here is something which has a local divergence of the claimed structure. So, and of course, this is far from obvious for the general case, and uh, this is the statement here. So then, uh, second comment is, so, as we um, remarked here, the final result obtained of this, by this R operation is still a function of epsilon. So, epsilon is always kept as a free parameter here, uh, so that dimensionality. And, however, once we are at the final result where uh, we have an analytic function in epsilon, we can, of course, set epsilon to zero and go back to the really physical dimension four or six and um, that then really defines our physical result for the quantum field theory. So let me write this also down. In the final result, uh, R of G, then we can set epsilon equal zero. And we can do something else which is important. Namely, in our numerators, in general Feynman graphs, like in QCD or QED or uh, other theories, we have objects like gamma matrices, and also they are treated in D dimensions in the intermediate steps. And at this point, where everything is finite and analytic in epsilon, we will also replace those D dimensional gamma matrices by actual four dimensional ones in, in four dimensions. So, and replace formally d dimensional gamma matrices, etc., by d zero dimensional ones. And this then gives the uh, physical final result. So just to make that clear, in uh, all intermediate expressions, we uh, do not do this. We keep epsilon arbitrary, and we also keep these formally d-dimensional quantities. That also holds for the subdiagrams and for um, counter terms and so on.
so let me just call it gamma, sub d, mu, etc., representing uh, any of those formally d dimensional quantities. Then I will actually not discuss here this small detail, the limit of this curly epsilon going to zero for the propagator uh, I epsilon prescription. For that, I will refer to the literature. And uh, this is discussed extensively in a paper by HEP, also in Communications of Mathematical Physics. And I will write here the reference number two, comma, 302 from 1966. <clears throat> because this is not depending on dimensional regularization. And uh, uh, therefore, we can rely on this statement. There is another important remark which we will not discuss today, at least. Namely, we need to make sure in uh, such a procedure, if we have a regularization renormalization procedure, at the end we obtain a quantity which is finite, but we need to ask, is this quantity in line with fundamental quantum field theory postulates like unitarity and causality? So do these renormalized objects define a theory which has a correct physics interpretation? And this is still not entirely obvious, even from this proof, including the finiteness. However, it is the case. And let me first just give it here, uh, but we will not discuss it today. So this uh, procedure differs from this, let's say, uh, historical DPHC renormalization, which is purely in four dimensions. By finite local counter terms. At each order. And this establishes unitarity and causality because uh, unitarity and causality have been established for this BPHC renormalization and it is also known, and that uh, was discussed in our quantum field theory one lecture, that uh, you can always add uh, local um, and also Hermitian counterterms without modifying unitarity and causality. Therefore, this statement proves for dimensional regularization and for this, uh, re these renormalized expressions, unitarity and causality. Then, um, so it differs from BPHC by these local and finite counter terms. As you know, the finite part of all counter terms uh, is always um, chosen according to certain renormalization schemes. So this result here is unambiguous. It results from this R operation defined in this way where the counter terms are defined as the pure pole parts of the um, sub-renormalized expressions. And this defines a renormalization scheme, which is the so-called minimal subtraction scheme in dimensional regularization. This is one way to fix the finite counterterms. So this BPHC procedure fixes the finite counterterms in a different way, actually in a worse way, because here this is a scheme which is very well compatible with gauge invariance, while that is not, and this is historically one of the key uh, advantages of dimensional regularization because of which it is uh, almost always used in practice. Okay, so but uh, the fact that these finite counter terms are fixed is a remark. So this procedure 
defines uh, what is called the renormalization scheme. for the finite counter terms or finite part of the counter terms and the name of this scheme is the MS or minimal subtraction scheme. And other any other scheme can be obtained by adding finite local counter terms. Very good. This is the statement of this very important fundamental theorem. And today we will at least begin the proof, maybe also finish it. Um, but I want to give you a brief overview of the structure of the proof as I plan to do it. So as you see from the section title, the section we are doing right now is uh, not about the full proof, but about the setup. So here, um, the outline is that in this section 3.5 we will discuss the setup of the forest formula. Specifically adapted to um, our integrals that we encounter in dimensional regularization. Then we will also discuss the setup of the integrals. I will, uh, um, let's say, prove or um, write down a lot of uh, what I will call propositions, so small statements which are basically a collection of results that we have already obtained in various forms but uh, fully adapted to the structure of the proof as we need them. And uh, I will interject an example at the six loop level to illustrate a few of those issues. Then, in section 3.6, we will then complete the proof. And basically, it will be um, applying step by step these propositions that we have established before, uh, plus one extra ingredient, namely here we will actually need to do the integrals, of course. We will need to calculate integrals and uh, discuss the properties of the actual loop integrals and that will be done here. So here we will actually carry out loop integrations in the appropriate way to establish the properties that we want to establish. And also here I will interject a small example at the two-loop level to illustrate a few of the more general features. Actually, the example will come first and then the proof and uh, the way we will look at the loop integrations will be uh, taken over from uh, the case of the example. Okay, so this is the outline of today's and maybe the next lecture. Let us begin. Okay, so the first subsection is the setup of the forest formula with sectors. Because as we will see now, um, because we are using these uh, sectors for alpha integrations, the forest formula can actually be simplified and that is very useful for our proof. Um, this subsection is again graph theoretical only, so we do not discuss in integrals or convergence um, properties. Therefore, it could be part of our section 2, for example, section 2.7. And it also is not specific to dimensional regularization. And in fact, uh, what we discuss here has also been discussed in an early paper 
by Anikin and collaborators on uh, normal BPHC renormalization in four dimensions. So, what do I mean? So, I need to contrast two um, results that we have obtained in our section two, namely the general R operation, which was recursive, and the forest formula, which was not recursive. So, let us look at this comparison of the two results. In section 2.1, we discussed what we called the R operation, and which is the more uh, fundamental of the two operations, because that directly corresponds to counter terms in quantum field theory. So that meant we define a sub renormalized expression for any Feynman graph, and uh, the result of the R operation is a sum over all sets of disjoint 1PI subgraphs, gamma 1 to gamma s. Then we take uh, the full graph reduced by all these disjoint 1PI subgraphs, which essentially corresponds to a counterterm Feynman diagram. And then we insert into those uh, removed vertices uh, minus the divergence of the sub-renormalized expression for all these subgraphs. So uh, this gives essentially the counter term subtracting the divergence of the gamma 1 subgraph and it goes on like this for all subgraphs we have taken out of the full graph we multiply or insert uh, minus the divergence of them. This is the R operation and it's recursive because R bar of a big graph is given in terms of R bar of smaller graphs. Then the fully renormalized expression is obtained by uh, taking this and subtracting again the remaining overall divergence. So we can write it as 1 minus t applied on R bar of g. Now what I want to highlight here is uh, how does this T operation act? T always extracts the divergence of whatever it acts on, but what does it act onto in this R operation? The T always acts onto a bar of something. It never acts on anything else. It always acts only on a bar of something, which means that it only acts on sub-renormalized expressions. And for the sub-renormalized expressions, we can at least hope and we will also prove in general that uh, extracting the divergence gives something local. Whatever is the result of this T here in this formula is a local divergence, which can be written as a counter term in a Lagrangian. So this is an important remark. T acts only on a bar of anything and provides therefore a local result. I mean this is part of the statement of the theorem so this is not obvious at all but uh, that would be the hope. Anyway T only acts on a bar of something. Now let us compare this to what we had in our section 2.2 that was on the forest formula. was on the forest formula and for the forest formula we obtained basically a resolution of this recursion and uh, it looks like this r bar of g or we can e immediately say r without bar of g is the following sum namely a sum over all forests curly f and then for each forest, forest is a set of disjoint or nested subgraphs. So the difference is here we only have disjoint, here we have disjoint or nested. Um, then we take all the subgraphs gamma in the forest and we apply minus t sub gamma uh, product of all of them onto the graph G. That is the forest formula. Okay? And it uh, is equivalent to the R operation as we proved at least on a graph theory level. Now, 
what uh, I need to mention here is how is this product actually defined. So if you write it like this, it is a symbolic notation because these are operators which don't necessarily commute and whose definition is quite complicated. So I write down here what it means if we have nested subgraphs. For disjoint subgraphs, there is no problem because disjoint uh, T's commute, but nested T's do not commute, and so there is a particular ordering defined. And this ordering uh, comes from the construction. So this forest formula is equivalent to the R operation for the order which I now define. So by construction we have, if gamma 2 is a bigger graph than gamma 1, so gamma 1 is inside of gamma 2, then the product is defined as the following, namely only this order is defined, the big graph comes last, the smaller graph comes first, acting on gamma, and this definition is we take the big graph gamma and divide by the big subgraph gamma 2, and then we insert the divergence of gamma 2, but inside of gamma 2 we do this operation T gamma 1, so it means we take the divergence of gamma 2 divided by gamma 1, inserted gamma 1. So inside of this T operation, we have here T of gamma 1. That gets inserted into gamma 1, uh, gamma 2 over gamma 1. Then we extract the divergence of this and insert it into the full graph. And now you see, of course, a difference because here in this setup, we get T's which do not act on sub-renormalized expressions, but the T's can act on anything. They can act on unrenormalized graphs, gamma 1. And so the uh, result of such a T operation here might be non-local. And only after summing overall forests here we get local divergences um, for uh, counter terms. So an, an expression like this does not correspond to a counter term in a Lagrangian, only a certain combinations of them. So that means T also acts on gamma i directly, and that might have a non-local result. And in examples, of course, we have seen such non-local results. Okay, this is a contrast that I wanted to highlight. And now we remember that we work in the context of sectors, so our loop integrations are always transformed into alpha integrations, and the alpha integration region can be split into different sectors, and if you remember, the sectors correspond to labeled forests um, that we can define for our full graph G. What happens if we connect the um, existence of sectors with our forest formula, then something very nice happens. Let me first uh, remind you of the basic uh, result that we obtained in our section 2.5, which was on sectors or labeled forests. So the notation was curly C and sigma, this is the forest, it is a maximal forest which has as many elements as there are loops. This is a labeling which connects, uh, singles out one unique line for each subgraph here. And uh, then we get an integration region which is defined such that in each subgraph the labeled line has the largest alpha and all the other lines in the same subgraph have a smaller alpha than the labeled one. So, and uh, all these different sectors or labeled forests span the full alpha integration region. Then, if we think of an integration, then we can write symbolically that our graph G can be decomposed into a sum over all sectors of the individual um, 
sector results for the graph. And now here, uh, please excuse my um, double use of the same symbol, because so far G stands just for the Feynman graph. Now G stands for the integral corresponding to the Feynman graph. And let me not introduce a new symbol for that. Let's just use the same symbol. But what I mean here is that this is the integration or the integral for the graph G in alpha space. And uh, this is then obviously the reduction of this or the, um, yeah, the reduction of the integral to this sector. And then uh, since uh, these sectors um, are mutually disjoint in the sense of integration and span the full alpha space. Uh, this is an obvious decomposition of the integral. Now we can connect this to the, to the forest formula. So imagine we have, for example, such an expression T sub gamma acting on the full graph G. Then this is defined like here. So as G divided by gamma and then we insert T of gamma. And uh, let me use this star notation again um, to denote that in the integration, this insertion is actually a complicated um, operation, not just a multiplication. Well, now we have here, nevertheless, a product of two um, graphs and uh, two integrations, because here there is an integration, which then gives rise to a divergence. And then here there is an overall integration um, over something which has an insertion. But these are two independent integrations and each of them can be split into sectors again. So what are the sectors corresponding to these two integrations? So the sectors are of course, there is one sector C1 comma sigma 1 for G over 8 gamma. And there is another sector, C2, comma, sigma 2, for gamma, for the subgraph. And then this can be written as G over gamma for the sector C1, sigma 1. And we insert the result here for gamma evaluated in the sector 2. So this is an obvious decomposition. And now we remember that in our section two, we proved a lemma, lemma three, which tells us that the sectors for the big graph G are in one-to-one -one correspondence to sectors uh, with such a decomposition. So if we have a subgraph gamma, then there are a number of sectors for the full graph which contain the subgraph gamma. And then for those sectors, there is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between those big sectors and the subsectors for the reduced graph and for the subgraph. So this was one of the statements of this lemma three. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence of these sectors here to sectors C comma sigma for the full graph with the property that gamma is a part of this forest C. And then it means that we can split the entire forest formula also into sectors. So now we have told that the uh, full graph G um, as an integration can be split into some overall sectors for the full graph. Now, for one such counterterm insertion, we can also prove, uh, we have just established, that it can be written um, as a sum over sectors, where the sectors uh, for the reduced graph and the subgraph correspond to certain sectors of the full graph, where gamma is, of course, part of the full sector. And now this has an obvious generalization, even if we have products of nested or disjoint gammas, and I will now write down immediately the generalized form of this. 
And uh, the upshot is that we can express the right hand side of the forest formula also as a sum over all sectors. Okay, so what is the upshot for the full sector decomposition? It means that we can split the forest formula also into sectors. And that looks like this. So R of G can now be written as here the sum over all forests. F. And now uh, in each forest, we have products of different subgraphs disjoint or nested. And to each product, we can apply this lemma 3 and uh, this correspondence here. That means we have a sum over all sectors. sectors for all the subgraphs and for the reduced graph and uh, they are in one to one correspondence to sectors for the full graph with the property all elements of the forest are also elements of this sector C. Then we have this one to one correspondence. And then it goes on. Product of all the gammas in the forest, minus T gamma um, on G. And of course, here we have to be in the appropriate sector. Or let's call it subsector. So this is the basic consequence of this. And now we can rewrite this in a nice way. And that gives us a very important consequence, which basically gives a um, symbiosis or the best of both worlds from the forest formula and from the R operation. So we rewrite the sum here in the following uh, trivial way. So the sum over all forests. Then we have here a sum, and uh, I wrote here a long text to make it more clear to see the uh, correspondence to this lemma 3. But what this really tells us is that um, this forest F must be a subset of the forest C, because any element here is also an element there. That means what we simply have is F is a subset, maybe equal or not, of this maximal forest C. That is what we have. And then we sum over all uh, sectors with this property. And then we have a product of all the gammas in our forest minus T gamma acting on something. And now let's rewrite this. So the obvious way to rewrite it is first we have a double sum over all forests and then over all sectors which are supersets of the forest. So we can write this exactly in the opposite way. We sum over all uh, C and then over all forests which are subsets of C. So this is obviously the same summation. So we sum over all sectors C and then over all forests which are subsets of C. This is the same uh, summation range that we have here. Then this gamma element M F minus T gamma. And now what does that actually mean? We fix now our full for or our maximal forest C and sum over all subforests of it. When we sum over all subforests of this big forest C, then it means any element here can be either inside or outside of F. So what we get here is the, what is called the power set. So the set of all subsets of C. Each element can be either inside or outside. And that has the following effect. Namely, this entire summation here is the same as we can remove this summation and simply say product of all the gammas of the big thing C. And now each 
is either inside or outside f. That means we multiply 1 minus t gamma. That's just the same thing. So because this effectively generates the power set, the set of all subsets of C. Any element can be either inside or outside. Therefore, this product here of all um, selected elements is the same as this. Okay, and that is now a dramatic simplification of our forest formula. Because our forest formula, which has this uh, overall structure, can now be written as a product of factors like 1 minus t gamma. So, R of G is now a sum over all sectors, explicitly written here. Sector has a maximal forest and a labeling of R of G specific for this sector. And then for each sector, we have the following obtained from here. For each sector, we now have this product here product of all gammas in this maximal forest. So there are now always as many gammas as there are loops. But we multiply 1 minus t gamma acting on the full graph G. And of course, this is to be applied in the appropriate subsector. So each integration of each subgraph or reduced graph is done in the appropriate subsector of this um, original sector. And of course, just to remark it once again, the order and the meaning of products of these is as before. This is our first important result today. So we have simplified our forest formula by going to specific sectors, and by going to specific sectors, um, we end up with such products over exactly as many factors as there are loops. And uh, each factor basically means we take a graph and subtract from it the divergent part, which means essentially it makes the graph in some sense finite. At least uh, the appropriate sector is made finite by such an operation. This is the idea. So it is a, an improved forest formula. And uh, to see the improvement in um, detail, let us see how each p gamma now acts. What does a certain t gamma act on? It acts on many other factors of the form 1 minus t gamma of smaller subgraphs gamma on G. So explicitly, we have, let's say, product of um, for any specific gammas, gamma, the subgraphs are ordered such that uh, this t gamma um, on the right of it, there must be all gamma prime which are smaller than gamma, but inside of our sector C. Okay? So on the right of T gamma, there always appears this product, 1 minus T gamma prime, acting on the full graph G. So necessarily, the T's are ordered like this. So what is actually the definition according to what I told you? This such a product of T's is defined as G divided by this uh, particularly chosen subgraph gamma, which is bigger than all these gamma prime subgraphs, then we insert into it the divergence T of whatever comes here. And this is now the product of all these gamma primes, which are subgraphs of uh, this gamma itself, 1 minus T gamma prime acting on gamma. And what is that, what we have here in the round bracket? What we have here in the round bracket is nothing but 
the renormalized part of our subgraph gamma, because if you look at this formula, it's exactly the same formula, just replacing G by a smaller graph gamma. So what we have here inside of T is really, except that we have this unequality sign, which means that we have here the sub-renormalized gamma. So what we have here is R bar of gamma in the appropriate sector. That means, now in this way of writing the forest formula, even though it's a forest formula, the T's only act on sub-renormalized expressions. Sector specific, that is the trick, but sub-renormalized expressions. That means in this way of setting up the forest formula, whenever T acts on anything, the result can be hoped for to be a local divergence. So this is a big improvement. So T only acts on R bar of something, but sector specific. Now, what we uh, will prove actually in our theorem is a stronger statement than what is written in the statement of the theorem. Namely, um, we wanted to prove that R of G is finite and the divergences of R bar of G are local. What we will actually prove is that already for each individual sector, this R of G has all the desired properties, and this is of course a stronger statement. I mean, there are no cancellations of divergences between different sectors. It is kind of obvious, but uh, nevertheless, it's a stronger statement than uh, what is written in our original formulation of the theorem, but that is what we are going to prove. And uh, the proof is made uh, easier, or it helps in the proof that uh, this forest formula can be written in this way, where uh, T always acts in this simpler way. And any result of any T operation um, can be hoped to be local. And uh, as we will see, that is really the case, and that helps in doing the proof. So that is very good. That is the first important progress that we have made. OK, to prepare the next steps and also to give an example to the previous forest formula, let us look briefly at an example of a six-loop Feynman diagram. So this is a graph with six loops. Here you have a one-loop graph, then a two-loop subgraph, a third loop, fourth loop, fifth loop, and then an overall six-loop diagram. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to illustrate is this ordering of the subgraphs. Let us choose one sector. Uh, in other words, let us first choose a maximal forest of six different subgraphs, which span the full graph. And let me uh, give a choice. So this should be one of the subgraphs here, obviously. Then this should be one subgraph. Then the bigger two-loop graph here containing this should be a subgraph. This other triangular graph should be a subgraph. Then this entire block, this is a four-loop block, that should be a subgraph. And then we have already five subgraphs and the full graph should be the sixth um, graph in our maximal forest. Now question, what is one of the possible um, allowed orderings of the T operations corresponding to these subgraphs. And let us just uh, do it by giving names uh, H1, H2, H3 for the six different subgraphs. So, in other words, our um, forest C should contain subgraphs with the names H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and then the full graph G. And uh, these indices should correspond to the order in which we are allowed to do the T operations. Now, there are different possible orderings, but uh, there always exists, of course, an ordering which is allowed. And so, let me just give you one. Let us start with this subgraph H1 here that goes for itself, and uh, it should be the first one um, which appears in our product of the Ts. Then this second one-loop subdiagram. H2 should be the second, 
That is also possible. And then we can take this two loop subdiagram which contains H2 but also the triangle. Let's call this H3. So H3 is a two loop graph containing H2 and also the triangle. Then here there is another one loop subgraph, the right triangle which is disjoint from that one and disjoint from this one. So let us take this as the fourth element. This could also be the first, so it doesn't have to be the fourth. It, as I said, this is completely disjoint from that. So they, the T operations for these two would commute, but let's take this as the fourth one. Then this must come later. So this four loop block here, this entire object here, that must definitely come after H4 and it must come after H3. That is a must. Um, and so this is possible and then the full graph G must come last. So that would be a possible ordering of the subgraphs. So that is always possible to find such an ordering and here we have illustrated this. Now let me introduce a few other things with the help of this graph which um, are uh, important for us later. The first I want to illustrate are the T variables. Remember that uh, by going to the sectors, the alpha parameters are replaced by Ts and betas, and the structure is such that for each subgraph in um, the maximal forest C, there is one T, so, or in other words, there is one T for each loop in the full graph. So here, there is T1 up to T6, and T6 we might also call Tg for the full graph G. But anyway, there are six such T variables because we have six loops. Then let us now make a table. And in this table, I would write here the subgraphs H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and G or H6 in other words. And maybe I will do some uh, operations with these subgraphs later on in the table. But let us now write down here the alphas for the individual um, subgraphs. Now, what do the alphas look like in our subgraph H1? So here H1 has two alphas, this one and that one. One of them is labeled. The other one is not labeled. The labeled one, uh, we know exactly in terms of the T's how this alpha looks like. Let us write down um, the labeled uh, alpha in this subgraph. It would have T1 square, but not only because this is a subgraph of the big graph uh, G. So it contains T1 square times T6 square. And this is the precise expression for the labeled alpha in this subgraph. And the other alpha is then given by this times beta. Okay. Now, how does it go on? What about the subgraph H2? H2 is also a one loop subgraph and it contains two lines. One of them is labeled and the labeled line is, has an alpha just given by T's, but which T's? Of course, T2 for this subgraph, but then this is a subgraph of H3, so it contains also T3, and it is a subgraph of H5, so it also contains T5, and the subgraph of G, so it contains T2 square times T3 square times T5 square times T6 square. Right? Okay, how about H3? Now H3 is a two-loop graph. In the two-loop graph, we have two kinds of lines. On the one hand, this H2 belongs to H3, of course, but we have also already seen what are the uh, T's in H2. So what is now interesting is the remainder. So we are uh, wanting to know what is the alpha in this line, in this line, and in this line, and in this line, but those two alphas are already known. So how do we denote this? We can denote it by H3 bar, 
which is defined as H3 divided by H2. So the interesting lines for us now are the ones in this reduced graph H3 reduced by its subgraph H2. This gives us exactly the remaining lines, this, 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 and this, four remaining lines. And what are the alphas for those four lines? They do not contain T2, but they contain T3, T5, and T6. So they contain just T3 squared, T5 squared, and T6 squared. And these are precisely the alphas in uh, this reduced graph. And I will now denote H3 bar is, uh, let's say, the non-trivial or the new part of H3. In other words, it's H3 reduced by its subgraph H2. Okay, then H4 is easier. H4 contains T4 and T5 and T6. Then H5, um, for H5 we again have to think. So H5 contains H4 and H4 is already treated. It also contains H3 and H2 which are already treated. So the interesting part in H5 are precisely the two new lines. Where are the two new lines? This is new, it is not yet covered. And this is new, it's not yet treated. So what are the T's for these two lines? One of them, one of these two lines must be the labeled line for H5. And this, uh, and uh, that one would have an alpha only given by T's and the other one has also a beta. So these two lines are precisely the lines of the graph H5 bar, which is defined as H5 reduced by H3 and H4. So it's quite a complicated graph. Well, not complicated, but it uh, is the graph that results if we shrink the previously treated subgraphs to points. So graphically, this H5 would look like this. So this whole red triangle is now shrunk to a point. The red is uh, the right triangle is also shrunk to a point and then only two lines remain. So this is how this H5 bar looks like. And these two lines are precisely these two lines here. Okay, so it looks like a counter term graph where we have here an insertion for a two loop counter term and here for a one loop counter term. Okay, so this H5 bar, and it has two lines, and uh, the T's for these two lines are just T5 square times T6 square. Then finally, the graph G. What are the interesting lines in the graph G? The, the, uh, they are the remaining lines which are not yet discussed. And again, we can um, highlight the remaining lines by taking the graph G bar, which is everything that remains when we reduce the previously treated subgraphs to points, which is here in this case G divided by H5, the full um, object here on the left, times H1, the one loop subgraph. So uh, graphically, this looks like this. So all of this thing here has been shrunk to, let's say, a counter term. This is shrunk to a counter term, so that would be a four loop counter term. This would be a one loop counter term. And what remains is this. This is this big line, and those three lines are this line over here, this line over here, and this line over here. And these lines have the following T content, namely, they contain only. T6 square and nothing else. And one of these four lines must be the labeled line for the graph G. Okay? This is how it works. So now we have understood the T variables in all the different subgraphs. And of course, you see a hierarchy for the Ts, um, which is complicated and which reflects the nesting and the disjoint properties of the subgraphs. So for example, H4 and H3, they are in some sense, on a similar level, but they are disjoint. And uh, so this means that uh, the, this part here is the same, and uh, those um, T's are different. And here, H2 is a subgraph of H3, and this is manifested in this object being the same, and here there is just one additional 
um, p factor. Okay, so this um, t variables reflect the subgraph structure. Now, you see, of course, that each subgraph defines uh, its own t variable, t1, t2, up to t6. And then in each subgraph, there are always some additional t variables appearing, except for here. Therefore, we can introduce the following notation. Let us introduce the following notation. Let us always write for each subgraph this product as the particular t for the subgraph times some remaining factor, psi 1. And here, the particular t variable for the subgraph t2 times a remaining factor psi 2 square. And then psi 2 square is the product of these three t variables, okay, and so on. t3 square, psi 3 square t4 square times psi 4 square. And here, accidentally, because of the subgraph structure, this psi 3 and psi 4, they are both the same and they are equal to this product here. But anyway, for each subgraph, we can define such a psi factor, which gives the remaining t variables. Also here, then psi 5 is just the same as t6. And here we do it also psi 6 square, but psi 6 is by definition 1. So we can always do this, and so in this way we define some unique t and uh, let's say a remainder. So that could be useful uh, to denote uh, or to write down general formulas. Now what we can also do here with the help of this example is subgraph aware variables. Q's momenta. So in order to write down the Q's, let us uh, give first of all a notation for the incoming vertices because the um, unique momenta are defined as incoming to each vertex. So let me do the same as here. So let's start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, ten, eleven, twelve. So the Feynman graph has twelve vertices. And at each vertex, we define an incoming momentum, P1, to P12. Momentum conservation tells us that um, P12 can be given by uh, some of all the other ones. So one of them can be eliminated by momentum conservation. And now our task is to find subgraph aware momenta which have the following property. So for each of those unique um, parts of the graphs, which I denoted here by h bar always. So this is always the reduced uh, graph, reduced by everything um, that is a subgraph inside of it. So there should now be for each of those unique graphs um, a set of independent momenta, such that each graph can be uniquely characterized by those momenta and that the um, set of all those cues uh, describes the full graph as well. So how can we do that? So what is a possible choice for our subgraph H1? That is obvious. So let me write it in blue here. Subgraph H1, we choose the left incoming momentum P8. So this should be the first of our cues. Then let us go on and choose an independent incoming momentum for our subgraph H2. That incoming momentum could be our momentum P3. P3 is, uh, and P4 is then given by momentum conservation from the point of view of H2. Then for H3, H3 contains H2, so we reduce H3 by H2 and replace that by a point. Then uh, the remaining um, graph has only those external momentum. It has the external momentum 2. The combination of 3 plus 4 
5 and 11. Okay, so it's a reduced graph. So what are the independent momenta of this? So this complicated business here of uh, joining momenta 3 and 4 uh, is not necessary. We can just take the elementary momenta 2, 5, and 11. So let's do that. P5, uh, P2, P5, and P11. Then this uh, subgraph H3, which has four vertices, because these are joined, uh, gets three independent external momenta. Then the next is H4, that is simple again. It's a one-loop graph with uh, elementary external momenta, 6, 7, and 12. To be independent, we choose two of them. Let's choose P6 and P7. Then the next is again complicated. Let me write down here again the reduced version of this graph. So H5 bar is this. So we reduce all the subgraph here to a point, and we reduce this subgraph to a point, and what remains is just uh, these two lines. And now this point here is a joint uh, of the vertices 2, 3, 4, 5, 11. This point joins the vertices 6, 7, and 12. So the incoming momentum here is the sum of 6, 7, and, and 12, for example. And the incoming momentum here would be the sum of P2, 3, 4, 5, 11. So let's take the simpler one. Uh, we must take one of them because there are two momenta. Momentum conservation requires that we choose one of them. And so the simpler one is this P6, 7, and 12. So we choose here as the independent subgraph aware momentum P6 plus P7 plus P11, um, 12. Okay. Then, uh, next, our full graph G, um, as I said, so this looks like this. This is a vertex coming from contracting all of this to a point, so this has incredibly many incoming momenta, P2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, and 12. This has incoming momenta, 8 plus 9, and here we have incoming momentum 10, and here we have 1. So we need three independent momenta because we have four vertices. In other words, three independent momenta. So the simplest ones are P1, comma, P8 plus 9, and P10. Now we have defined for each subgraph independent momenta, uh, uh, for the part, of the, let's say for the unique part of the subgraph, in other words, which is always the subgraph reduced by its maximal subgraphs. Question. This set of momenta, first of all, how many independent momenta have we put here? And is it true that these independent uh, momentum variables span and can describe uniquely our full graph G. Let's count how many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So these are eleven variables. One less than we have vertices, so this is precisely the correct number to have a unique description. And uh, so the second question is, can we by linear combinations, get back all the indip individual external momenta. So P8, P3, P2, P5, P11, P6, P7, that is all independent. But P12 only appears in this combination. So can we uh, access P12 individually? Yes, because we have P6 and P7 individually. And by this linear combination, it means we can also describe P12 independently. P1, P10, P8, and P9 only appear in this combination here. But here there is P8 individually. Therefore, also P9 can be accessed individually. And then we have 11 independent momenta accessible by this. One is missing. Which one is missing? Uh, which one is missing? So uh, one, two, three appears. 
but P4 never appears. P4 is the one which we have left out. P4 and all other general all PIs um, can be obtained by linear combinations. Therefore, we are able to find subgraph of variables. We know this because we have proved it and established it already before, but this is again illustrated here. And subgraph aware variables mean precisely this, that for each subgraph, more precisely for each reduced subgraph, reduced by its maximal subgraphs, we find a unique set of momenta describing the subgraph and then these momenta span also the full graph. So let me comment here on this operation here. What I did here, uh, the system behind it, is that each time we want to access the new unambiguous lines which just belong to this subgraph but not to the previous ones. And we do that by reducing it with respect to its maximal subgraphs which are in the forest here. So this extracts the unique lines by reduction with respect to the maximal subgraphs. So I always chose here the maximal subgraph even without telling you, but here for example H5 is most non-trivial. So H5 is this block. It contains three subgraphs, namely the one loop, the two loop, and this one loop. And the maximal subgraphs are this two loop subgraph and the one loop, and we reduced by this combination. And similarly here for the big graph G. Right. Let us do a few more. Um, Items that we can learn from the example. So imagine the following. You uh, do this forest formula. Uh, you, so you apply 1 minus t gamma step by step. You apply 1 minus t gamma for each of these graphs in, um, in this forest. So let's say we treat these factors and we start by 1 minus t h1, then 1 minus t h2. We always do uh, whatever is necessary to evaluate this operation until some point. Uh, and uh, to fix an example, let us do it up to h4. So imagine you treat these four operations um, until the subgraph H4 and then you stop and look at your result. So what will you see and what do you encounter? So let me first draw again the graph to visualize it. So let me draw in red what we have already treated in this sense. So this is treated, this was H1, this is treated, this is H2, then this H3 is also treated, then H4 is also treated, and now we stop and look at what we have. So the first question that we can discuss is, what is actually the structure of graphs that have already been treated? So it's the set of these red graphs. What is the structure of these graphs? So let's write it as a set. So the set contains, let me write it in this way, it contains the subgraph H3, which is this two-loop graph, and it contains H2, which is a subgraph of H3, so I write it like this. Then the treated graphs contain this subgraph H4, which is disjoint from H3. 
and of course also disjoint from H2. And it contains the subgraph H1, which is again disjoint from uh, all the other ones. Okay, so this is a structure. So the structure is that we have here a set of graphs. First of all, we have a few disjoint graphs, and then we have chains of nested subgraphs. So here, this is one chain of uh, nesting. This is the biggest graph in the chain, and there are some smaller ones. And uh, this is a disjoint set of such chains. And in general, of course, each time you might have more subgraphs, smaller and smaller subgraphs. So we have disjoint set of chains of nested subgraphs. So it's, of course, quite a complicated structure. But uh, because of this structure, clearly this set of treated graphs contains certain maximal elements. And these are the elements here in the first line. They are maximal in the sense that uh, they are no subgraphs of anything else, and they are disjoint, mutually disjoint. But they might contain some subgraphs. And this is not maximal because it is contained in H3. So there is the notion of maximal treated graphs. And here in this case, the maximal treated graphs would be H3, H4, H1. So this is the structure. And we might want to define uh, a name for this set of all the treated graphs, and we might to define, want to define a name for the set of the maximal treated graphs later on. Now imagine that you go on. So you have understood what you have done. Now we do the next step, and the next step is uh, we apply TH5. Let us treat this factor here and do the renormalization for the subgraph H5 as well. Then we can ask again, what is the set of the treated graphs? And then the set of treated graphs um, looks like this. So we have much bigger graph H5. And this contains, let's say, H3, H2, H4, and H1. Okay? So the set looks like this. That means we have a new treated graph. And this defines a much bigger chain of nested uh, or disjoint subgraphs. And uh, there are only two maximal treated graphs now. So new maximal treated graphs. And uh, that might be interesting to know. So by treating uh, the new graph H5, we basically join together two uh, loops which were previously disjoint. So they now become joined in H5, but previously we could independently renormalize this and that. And now uh, they have to be treated together because they are all subgraphs of H5. So this is kind of what can happen if we go step by step and treat all these different factors here. A final remark I want to make is uh, about the variables. So imagine you have treated everything up to here, as we said before. Then your result contains, of course, some variables. So let's imagine, in particular, that uh, treating this means also to do the loop integration. Then after you do this, you have done the integration over the variable t1. So t1 doesn't exist anymore. Then here you do the integration over the variable t2, so it doesn't exist anymore here. Uh, you do the integration over the variable t4, so it doesn't exist anymore. So each time in these rescalings here of the alphas, certain t variables get integrated over, and afterwards, of course, the variables don't exist anymore, but uh, some simpler expressions remain. So in particular, if we have done everything up to t4, then what, uh, what remains is before treating uh, h5, we have, let's say, combinations like t5 squared times psi5 squared. This would appear. 
and afterwards uh, T5 doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, wherever previously this would appear, afterwards only this appears. And uh, that means in certain integral expressions and functional dependencies, um, the set of dependencies change and uh, we will um, be able to take this into account by doing something like a rescaling. So the previous variables get replaced by rescaled variables. So previously maybe variables are like this. Afterwards they get rescaled to something like this. So this is something that you can observe here from the example. So let me underline the take-home messages I wanted to make here in this example. The take-home messages are ordering of the subgraphs is always possible. Here we have done an example. Then we have done the T variables. There are as many T variables as there are loops. The T variables appear in a certain structure and we have defined or seen that it might be useful to define always such a factor psi for each subgraph which denotes all the other T variables that we need in this particular subgraph. Then we have seen that we can always define subgraph aware momentum variables for such a chain of subgraphs. And we have seen that it is useful to uh, do this reduction with respect to maximal subgraphs in order to extract unambiguously the lines which have a particular T dependence. And uh, we can denote always this reduction here, this let's say unique part of a subgraph by a subgraph with a bar. Then, here by looking at this step-by-step -step evaluation of, um, let's say, the renormalization procedure, uh, we see that a notion arises of maximal treated graphs, which, let's say, it flips or it changes suddenly from going from here to here, the maximal subgraph structure changes um, a lot because new graphs can join previous maximal subgraphs. And we have seen that uh, these combinations of variables might uh, be changed over the course of the loop integration. So all of this is important insight for us and we will make use of this in our um, actual calculations. <coughs>